Hello everyone, Alexa Dunn here, and today we are talking about middles. The muddled middle, the dreaded middle, the middle. Middles are the worst. I'm so sorry if you love middles. Good for you, but I find that most writers struggle with the middle. I definitely struggle with the middle. It is a very human, normal response, uh, both in drafting and in revision. Middles can just cause a lot of problems, so I thought we would talk about the dreaded muddled middle, messy middle, I tend to call it both of those things, both things to keep in mind while you're drafting, but also practical tips that are going to help you in revising middles, because sometimes the best you can do is push through in drafting blah, the middle, you vomit out the middle, you just do the best that you can, anything you can to get past the middle, and then you fix it later. Very often you might not even know exactly what is your middle until you are done with the whole book because then kind of the structure and the beats fall into place. Yes, technically you should have the structure and the beats in place before you start writing, but sometimes books get away from us. The next thing you know you're like, oh, I thought this was the midpoint turn and now it's the break into three or oh, it moved up. It's a whole thing. So we're going to talk about middles. So first of all, the thing that I think you need to understand about the middle is one of my favorite beats. We are going to talk a bit about beats. It is the fun and games beat or the promise of the premise. Essentially, this is after the break into two, two being your middle, your second act, where you give the reader the promise of the premise and or the fun and the games. It's all of the stuff that the reason they wanted to read the book was this part. It's where you have fun with your premise. So for example, in The Hunger Games, the fun and game slash promise on the premise is the start of the actual Hunger Games. The training is done and Katniss goes up into the arena and people start to die. It's that first part of that section, because obviously the entire book is The Hunger Games, where it's the fighting for survival. It's the first set of choices. It's the first betrayal when it comes to PETA. It's the reader being like, yes, I came for this. I'm going to give you a couple other examples because you know I always go to the Hunger Games. So another example from one of my favorite books is Thursday Next. So in Thursday Next, the fun and game slash promise on the premise is when Thursday starts her investigation into Jane Eyre being missing, jumping into the book world for the first time, meeting different characters, all the different literary illusions, really playing with the fun part of the premise, which is she can jump into books. By the way, if you've never heard of or read Thursday Next, get thee to thy library or bookstore. It's Thursday Next by Jasper Ford. It's an entire series. The first book is called The Air Affair. It is one of my all-time favorite book series. I love it. I mean, really, I feel like the entire series is fun and games because it's all promise of the premise. And honestly, the best books I think do deliver on their premise all the way through. But this really is a specific section of your act two. And then in a romance, this is going to be the juicy part of your romance. It's after your meet cute and it's the characters getting to know each other. There's a push and pull. There's usually conflict, both internal and external, of, you know, questioning feelings and things coming between them. It's, it's that exciting first build of attraction and romance. If this were a movie, it might be your movie montage. So bear that in mind, like the shopping makeover montage, for example. It's really key to have this section in your act two, because if you don't, the reader is going to feel ripped off. It's the reason they're here, guys. But the downside of the fun and games promise on the premise is sometimes you can take it too far. You can do too much of it and you get into dragging your pacing territory. And we're going to talk a lot about pacing when it comes to the middle, because the middle is a very delicate balancing act of pacing. It is really the longest act in your book. Act one should be pretty short and sweet. Act three should be pretty short and sweet. But act two, if you follow the bell curve model, is this entire part of the curve. Like act one's over here and act three's over here and you got all this space to fill over my head. So you have a lot of work to do. It is the longest section of the book, but it's broken into other little sections and beats within it. And it's a delicate balance. They're not all equal in length and time. And it's knowing when to dip into something, how long to have it and when to get out of it. And we don't always nail this 
on the first draft. So as I talk about some of the other kind of pitfalls and things to bear in mind for your middle, think about the delicate balancing act of this pacing. Your reader, this is the section of the book where you're giving them tons of information, tons of character development, tons of plot development. A lot of things need to be happening, but you don't want to tip to your midpoint turn, which is your twist in the middle, or your break into three too soon, because then the pacing is going to feel rushed. You need to give the reader enough in act two that they feel satisfied with what they get in act three. This is why writing books is hard, guys. There's a lot that goes into it. So the next thing I want to talk about is what I call the series of unfortunate events. You both need this and don't maybe want to do this depending on the book. Have you ever read a book where it, it feels like a series of unfortunate events? It's just thing after thing after thing after horrible thing that happens to the character. And at a certain point as the reader, you get really sick of it. You're like, I'm sick of just this character getting hit in the face over and over again, and it doesn't move on. They're not learning anything. They're not picking themselves up. They're not doing anything about it. Or there isn't a significant reversal that comes into play. Again, this is a pacing, dragging situation. You're doing too much of a series of unfortunate events, which is essentially conflict. You are throwing obstacles at your characters and you want to throw obstacles at your characters, but it's a balancing act once again. So in a romance, for example, it's too many obstacles. It's too many series of terrible things that happen that get in the way of the romance. You want the fine balance between terrible thing happens, terrible thing happens, and then maybe you have a slight reversal. There's a moment shared and then something bad happens again. You do need conflict to keep going. So when it comes to a series of unfortunate events, you need to check yourself. And when in doubt, refer to the rule of threes. I think three is a nice healthy number, not only for your fun and games promise of the premise, three setups, but if you're doing a series of unfortunate events, which can be the premise on the premise, by the way, they can be the same thing. Limit yourself to three if you're really unsure. Skilled writers can of course do more, but three is a nice magic and compact number. Generally speaking, if you do three that are well set up and paced, you're good to move on. You basically are looking for a balance between your your reader going, oh no, what else wrong could happen? I have to keep reading and getting really annoyed at you and giving up. And generally your series of unfortunate events, your conflicts, your obstacles, and some reversals are leading you up to the big midpoint turn. It's usually right in the midpoint of your book, but not always exactly in the midpoint because don't we love to be confusing? But generally speaking, it is going to be very, very close to your middle. I'm gonna talk more about that in a minute. But first, we're gonna talk about asking and answering questions. This is an essential element of writing a page turner. If you've watched the video that I have on that, which I will link to down below, it's how I use micro cliffhangers, which is essentially just a strategy I use for dropping into chapters and coming out of chapters that always leaves the reader with a question. You always want them to have the question, even if that question is, what's gonna happen next? It's, how are they gonna get out of this? How are they going to react to this? Is this going to teach them something? Are they going to learn and grow? If it's kind of more of a mystery thriller, it's, are they going to figure out this clue? What is the next clue? Did this person do it, etc. So you're always leading them through to the next section with a question, but you need to be answering questions along the way. It shouldn't just be question, 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 building. Sometimes it might just be you end a chapter on a question and you answer it on the next page, but you want to be building this in act two because that's what act two, the middle really is. It is prompting questions, answering them, but leading to more questions balanced with fun and games, promise and the premise, a series of unfortunate events and lots of reversals leading up to the midpoint turn and then to the break into three. Middles are hard. Personally, when I write my middles, when I'm actually drafting my middles, this question and answer thing isn't just for the reader, it's for me as the author. I might literally jot down a series of questions that 
I need to answer, <laughs> essentially, as the writer, but also the questions that my main character is asking themselves based on the information I've given them, based on what I've written so far. And I use these questions and answering them myself as the writer to push me through the middle. When I get stuck, I go back to asking myself questions. Okay, well, where do I have them right now? What is the information that they have? Where do I need them to go? And so what questions do I need them to ask and then have answered that will prompt more questions that will push the story forward? There will, of course, also then be questions and answers for your reader, but this also works on the meta writer level. I like to think of the middle as a trifle, if you're familiar with that, because you know I love half-baked baking metaphors, but I like this one because you want to be always adding layers of cream, sponge, and fruit cocktail. Um, moments of tension and conflict followed by moments of rest and reflection for your characters. Yes, I'm referring to my notes because I sounded smart when I wrote it down. That essentially every time you answer a question and your character feels like they know where they are and what's going on, you're throwing another obstacle at them to put them off balance to propel them forward. Often this is part of the series of unfortunate events. And this is how you're going to build not only the reading experience for the reader, but the plot progression and character growth for your character. You also, by the way, uh, want to give your character ample time to reflect on things. Every time something bad happens or there is a reversal, you need to give your character time to settle into that. Not too much time. Again, you're gonna drag your pacing. Be careful, middle suck. Uh, but you want to take that moment because your reader needs that moment too. Your reader needs that moment to digest what has just happened. Whether it's a new obstacle, whether it's learning new information, it's wrapping up one problem while opening a present for another. These moments are essential throughout the book, honestly. You should also always have these kinds of moments of reflection throughout Act 1 and Act 3, especially my favorite thing I love to talk about, books that miss the denouement, who don't have it, whole other topic. But you always want to take those little moments. But again, the push and pull of the middle, the trick that is so hard to land and sometimes does get fixed in revision is figuring out the balance. How much time do you spend on one versus another? Do you need every reflection point? Sometimes it does benefit your story most to go from obstacle to obstacle to obstacle. It's a balancing act. Essentially, overall, when you're thinking about the structure and the beats and the pacing, talking about that midpoint turn again, is it literally is the bell curve. It is rising action coming up to a point up here where everything changes, either for the, the for good or for worse, though if it's for good, you're quickly going to do a reversal on that usually because conflict. Everything changes and then it all kind of tumbles downhill and it should fall right into your third act. From a pacing perspective, You re I really do like to think of books as a roller coaster. You're cranking people up and going up to the inciting incident and you go down and it's like, woo, and it's a, it's a ride. <laughs> Lots of ups and downs. It technically isn't just a steady climb and an up and a down. There are going to be ups and downs within that. And the key is not doing so many that people get bored or sick. You don't want to make a vomit. Metaphor is always getting away from me. But you definitely want to think about this. And it's very easy to do too little, rushing to the midpoint. It's also very easy to do too much, dragging before the midpoint or dragging after. The midpoint to the break into third is a shorter section than you actually think it is. Because once you've done your big turn, your big reversal, if you do too much after that, the reader is going to get bored slash annoyed, especially annoyed at your main character if it's a matter of them being too stupid to figure something out, uh, that they're trusting the wrong person, that they took the wrong path, whatever it is. So once you hit your midpoint turn, you wanna get to your break into three pretty quickly. I'll tell you, when you read a well-crafted book on Kindle, I always like to look at Kindle percentages. You must have your break into two by around the 20% mark. 20% mark is always where you're gonna see the kind of 
second inciting incident. There's always kind of a first one. And then there's the one that is the break into two, the decision to go on the journey. Your midpoint turn is going to fall between like 45 and 65%, usually closer to 50. And you should be breaking into your third act by the 70% mark on your Kindle. All great books do this. I've noticed the pattern. And then your last 30% of the book is act three. Another thing just talking about beats in terms of being important in the middle of your book. After the midpoint turn, you always want to have a beat where things seem fine. This is technically called the calm before the storm beat. This is a very important beat before you get into that break into three because you need to lull your readers into a false sense of security before you screw everything up because it's an emotional journey. You, you're bringing them high and you're bringing them low and you're lulling them into a sense of security before punching them in the face. So you, you're always needing to balance this. Again, this is why middles are so hard. It's making sure that you are hitting all of these beats, these emotional beats and asking questions and answering questions without dragging your pacing. The last practical thing I want to talk about is something that you're probably going to be looking at in revision, though if you're really great at this, you might catch yourself during drafting, but something that I have found happens in the middle especially, or perhaps is best fixed in the middle, that making these fixes in the middle can transform a middle, is over-dramatizing things where you can be narrating and narrating things where you should be dramatizing things. So again, I have an entire video on this topic generally, dramatization versus narration, and I will link to that down below. But pinpointing this editing tactic, drafting and editing tactic, has really helped me with my middles, revising my middles. And as I said in that video, when you're drafting, you should do whatever feels natural. Generally, my advice on the muddled middle with drafting is to do whatever you can to write it. Try to balance all of these different ideas and techniques, and I hope that talking about them has helped you go, aha, that's what I need in my middle, or aha, maybe that's why my middle doesn't work because it doesn't have that or it has too much of that. But very often, one of the reasons pacing is going to feel off, whether it's too fast or it's too slow, is dramatization versus narration. You might be over-dramatizing scenes and that's why they feel very, very long. You're doing an entire scene or multiple chapters of reflection, for example, through dramatization, people having conversations, usually it's talking about things, where you could have done a nice, neat, compact couple of sentences or paragraphs of narration to accomplish the same job or vice versa. You might have a lot of things neatly tied up with a bow in narration where the emotional, there isn't a rich emotional experience of whatever that narration is because you should be dramatizing it. You should be very carefully crafting a scene in a specific setting with specific characters to add to character growth and plot progression in a smartly dramatized scene, which often making that kind of switch can make the entire middle work. I have definitely had this happen on The Stars We Steal, my second book. I had a section that was, I actually switched the dramatization. I had one dramatization, I had one thing happening, but it was really just people kind of logicking things out through conversation. It was a conversation that was happening in an inert setting to get from one plot point to the other. And I realized if I changed it for a different setting with a completely different dramatization, I could actually have a richer emotional character moment, a character beat, which actually ended up being the essential calm before the storm for a romantic reversal that just it made the entire second act a lot more exciting. I essentially realized in hindsight that I had like a flat line in this section of the middle where I needed a little boop, little boop, an emotional boop for my characters essentially. Uh, and once I made that change, it sewed up the whole middle. So when you're going into revise, you can look for these spots where yeah, you have a scene and maybe it's okay, but is it really doing all the work that it needs to be doing or could be doing? And so one tip I can give you if you realize that you've dramatized something, but it's just not performing enough work, you can literally take the same dialogue and transpose it onto a more interesting setting and dramatization so that it performs greater plot and character work. I've definitely done that. Now just some more practical tips for revision that are gonna help you in kind of fixing some things in your middle. 
You want to look for places and scenes that repeat certain character beats and traits. Act two is a lot about developing characters and character relationships, but you can definitely have too much of a good thing, as I mentioned in the Fun and Games Promise of the Premise, and even series of unfortunate events. If you have four, you know, scenes of building a romance, do you need all four? Can you kind of tighten them to just have three? You want to look for those spots. Try not to beat any one conflict too far into the ground. I find this a lot. Again, my, some of my best examples are romance, but this could work for a friendship, any relationship that's in trouble, where it's just beat after beat after beat of, well, you said that one thing and I'm mad about it. Well, at a certain point, you need to resolve that and move on and create new, more interesting conflict. You can definitely have too much of essentially beating a dead horse. So you want to look for those spots where you can tighten. Essentially, every single scene in your second act, in your middle, should be building both to the midpoint and the break into three. Every scene and moment is performing a function. It is adding information for your reader. It is developing character. It is you know, asking questions and answering questions about the main mystery thread. In hindsight, when your readers think about your, your big twist in the middle and your break into three, so the dramatic thing that happens to propel you into the third act of the book, all of those things that they read in the middle, they should go, oh, that is what that was building toward. The, oh, they need to think back to moments that happened and they will feel more significant now or have greater impact. Really, your second act is the place of change, but that change needs to be subtle and gradual. You are definitely delicately building something. In act three, your character has changed or has the thing that really articulates the change, but act two is when you are going to be laying all of the breadcrumbs for growth, development, and change. It's really, really hard. Um, and that's kind of my disclaimer, my letting you off the hook. Middles suck. <laughs> There's no one cut and dry solution to writing better middles, to fixing middles. We all just have to muddle through our own middles, looking at what we're doing on the page, kind of our worst impulses, and then thinking about what the middle needs to do, paying attention to story beats, paying attention to story structure, and just doing our best to fix it. Because the scary, awful thing is that the middles are really the most important part of the book. Although first acts are really, really important, third acts are super, super important too. I think they're all important in different ways, but I'd say more books fall apart in the middle and more writers get stuck in the middle and never even finish a book. So to that end, that's why I feel that middles are the hardest and middles are the most important and you need the most pep talks and help for the middle, but it's also thus the hardest to talk about, the most difficult to articulate because it is so complex and specific to different people. And it's just the sheer size of the middle, the sheer number of beats, the balancing act, the delicate magician's act you need to pull off to create this beautiful, perfect middle. This was my best try at helping you guys out. I hope this helped. I hope I kind of illuminated some things maybe you hadn't thought about, articulated things you kind of knew, but maybe didn't know what to do with. I challenged myself to work on this one to really articulate it as I am struggling through a middle right now. I started the outline when I was fixing the middle for my last book and I'm filming now, drafting the middle of my next one. It's just always an evolving challenge of how to do it right the first time, knowing that you probably won't, and then figuring out how to fix it. Give this video a thumbs up if you liked it, and I will make more very long, hopefully helpful, slightly rambly videos about things that are hard about writing. If you're not already subscribed to the channel, go ahead and do that. I post new videos two to three times a week. Thank you so much for watching, and as always, guys, <sighs> happy writing, and good luck with the middle.